so um, our little break is over, so we'll go ahead and get started. Now for this last part, we're going to talk about NICPAD as a practice center. So earlier, you know, I showed there was a four-phase model that NICPAD uses to conduct their work. And so we just went over NICPAD as a resource center and showed you lots of different resources that we offer. But now we're going to talk about practice and putting some of those um, resources into practice um, where we've always created lots of cool things, but now we want to make sure that they are going to be used to truly make that impact. And while I'm talking about this in, in the way that NICPAD does their work, this is stuff that can be done by any of your, your organizations or programs that you work for. So whether you're with the public health department or um, a fitness facility, you can do a lot of this same work that we're doing um, if some of our resources and whatnot does not apply to you. So we always start with knowledge adaptation. First, we go with knowledge adaptation, we go through basically three steps, our inquiry, synthesis, and then tools and products. First, the inquiry is really what do we want or need to adapt? Then we, we take that information and we make the adaptations based on a framework that I'm gonna talk about, our GRADES domains framework, which GRADES stands for Guidelines, Recommendations, Adaptations, Including Disability. And I'm gonna talk about those five domains. And then with the adaptations, we also create some tools and products. So these are some of the outcomes of the adaptation. So we sometimes we'll have an adaptive program or we'll have an adaptive tool or product. So it is the, the outcome of what we've adapted. So with one of the one of the examples of our program adaptation is Girls on the Run. So some of you might be familiar with Girls on the Run, but this is an international program where girls are inspired to be joyful, healthy, and confident using a fun experience-based curriculum, which creatively integrates running. So while it's called Girls on the Run, they also include a lot of different youth development and healthy lifestyle um, components to the running program. So running is really just the vehicle to do some of this other work. Um, and they have a, they have one of their, their statements where they say they're committed to ensuring that their programs are accessible to any girl who wants to participate. And they have this, they have girls on the run in all 50 states. And the goal is to be able to run a 5k at the very end. So more recently, actually Kelly has worked very closely with girls on the run to adapt their program. It was identified that they needed to be more inclusive. So they, they worked with NICPAD to adapt the program. They identified um, the different areas that they needed to adapt. And then um, Kelly worked with them to create um, the adaptations, which they are currently pilot testing in different communities across the US. So the areas that we use to adapt are these five domains of built environment, services, instruction, equipment and technology, and then policy. We found so far that if we focus on these five domains and apply them to whatever program, services, um, guideline that needs to be made inclusive, that if we focus on these five areas, that we really truly can make it inclusive. So um, just in as, as an example of some of the program adaptations that were made um, that say, for example, Girls on the Run, that all practice venues and surrounding areas need to, they need to be assessed to make sure that they are accessible. So again, you know, like that video that we showed just before the break of Mary Allison looking at a fitness facility, Right? It's not just the, the venue that you're going to be practicing in or playing in, but you need to examine the parking lot. You need to examine is there a transportation stop nearby. Um, and so basically, from that person's home all the way inside the facility needs to really be assessed to make sure that it's inclusive and accessible. 
Um, some other program adaptations related to services, um, making sure that their staff are trained, um, not only in disability etiquette, but also in different adaptation principles related to disability, right? I and mean, Mary spoke to some of those in the video that we played over the break, um, where she just talked about not over adapting. Um, that could be one of the principles. An example of instruction and um, yeah, instruction would um, make it be making sure that whatever you're using for instruction, that you have appropriate alternative formats, um, whether it's for your worksheets and handouts or even your presentations. So while we showed that we showed a lot of NICPAD videos, you may have noticed that we also provide the closed captionings on those videos. And so that's an important alternative format that we've provided. Um, for adapted equipment and technology, um, you know, making sure that it's available um, for people who need it, depending on what their needs are, right? Whether it's a person with a physical disability who might use a wheelchair, or someone who might have some sort of sensory disability. Um, you know, in the cooking video, we showed that how people who are blind, um, just making little notches in the, in the measuring cups and, and spoons, um, it was a simple adaptation. Um, that could be made for someone who is blind. And then policy. Policy is really important to think about because policy is really what can lead to sustainable changes that also hold people accountable um, for accessibility and inclusion in the long term. It's not just checking the box, but you've got to actually follow through. So if we're saying that you need to train staff, it might be really important to actually have an explicit policy about what you're training them on and how often. Um, another program that we have adapted is Prevent T2 uh, for All or the Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, this was an adaptation of, some of you might be familiar with it, the Center for Disease Control's Prevent T2 curriculum. We, um, we worked with CDC very closely to receive approval from them. Um, made the adaptations, and then we actually had to go back to them to make sure that, um, you know, basically they endorsed it to say that this is a CDC approved program um, that meets all their criteria, uh, the same as the DPP, but it is inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, one of the really cool things about this is that we are currently, NICPAD is working um, through a different grant um, with, how many states is it? That's four different states that are um, going to be implementing this adapted program. And so again, you know, thinking about sustainability, they are targeting and training the master trainers. So this is built in to the program from the top up, and then will trickle down into the actual programs being implemented. Thanks, Mary. So another example of us becoming this practice to resource center is the creation of what we call our iChips. And by now you realize we really like our acronyms. So these are custom inclusive community health implementation packages. That's what iChip stands for. Um, and it really is the, our original iChip features interactive tools really to help the community or health practitioners or organizations, coalition members, um, incorporate and promote inclusion across all aspects of the community of their community health efforts. So we're going to take a look at our original iChip and you'll see kind of the essential elements of it. But what's kind of important to know is that we've created these iChips for each of our five sectors. So if our original iChip piece has components that you're like, man, that would be interesting in my field of X, um, know that we have those. And if you're interested in getting one of them, um, you can just contact us and we can put you in touch with the specialist that's in charge of that sector. We also, um, as Carrie was just mentioning, two of the programs we've adapted, we actually in our last grant cycle adapted 10 different evidence-based programs that are nationwide programs, two of which you mentioned, Girls on the Run and um, DPP, and we are currently working on creating these iChips for each of those programs. Um, so we just created ours for the Prevent T2 for All, and so when I go through these essential elements, um, it's really going to provide tools to help implement these programs. Um, and so we have those for those programs as well, which is really kind of how it trickles down. So we're going to look at the overall 
broad view of what our original iChip looks like now. Um, but again, be thinking of these in the context of whatever your individual sector might be. So this is the original iChip. The categories are placed off to the right, and then the inclusion piece that we created for each of these categories is on the left in the larger column. So we're going to go through each of these resources individually, um, but just knowing that we've created these for the target audience. So when we look at these essential elements, we have assessment and evaluation. So again, we have the T, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but you can think about assessment and evaluation for educators, for fitness professionals, for healthcare professionals. Um, so all, again, all of those. We have planning and leadership, health communication, or what that communication looks like, training and consultation, policy, and adaptation and implementation. So we'll look at how all of those play a role and what resources we've created for all of those. So the first one is inclusion and assessment and evaluation. In this section, you'll find resources that really help you gather the information on the extent to which the resource or the built environment are inclusive of all members of the community, including those with a disability. So as we've mentioned a couple times now, we have the Community Health Inclusion Index, and this really provides, or the individuals or the organization, there's different levels of it, with a resource to evaluate the level of inclusion of their community so in their individual environment. So I could try to explain all of these to you, but we have a fun little video that'll help do it a little bit better. Let's talk about the chi. No, that's Tai Chi. It's a form of martial arts. Chi, with two eyes, stands for Community Health Inclusion Index. You don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Basically, it's a tool. And if your aim is to improve your community so that it's healthier and more inclusive to people with disabilities, then you're probably going to want this tool. But it's not like a hammer, or a drill, or even a saw. The tool, you know, let's call it a tool bag. Inside your tool bag, you will find a level, a pressure gauge, a printed version of the Qi, or you can download the Qi onto your smartphone. The Qi is just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yes, but I was going to say, the Qi is just one step in an easy to follow four step process. The Qi is a tool used to assess possible inclusion gaps, and the information gathered from the Qi will help to bridge those gaps. Let's check out the diagram that'll explain the entire process. Now, keep in mind that this building could just as easily be a school, a park, a restaurant, or Susie's Corner Store. After you establish what needs to be assessed, like Susie's Corner Store, Step one, assess the building using the chi. A B minus? The chi does not actually give out grades after assessment. The chi will point out accessibility issues and provide the user with solutions. And now, back to the program. Step two, the gathered information is analyzed. From that, a plan is hatched and, oh, I'm sorry. I think this is the wrong planning session. That was embarrassing. Where was I? Oh, yeah, after the data has been analyzed, the planning phase begins. Now, here comes the most exciting part of all. Step three, implementation. Not all plans will require you to wear a hard hat, but that shouldn't stop you. And when you're done implementing, it's time for step four, the evaluation. So, I bet you're asking yourself, what can be cheated? Well, we broke that down into three sections, macro, organizational, and on-site assessment. So, macro, think streets and sidewalks, public transportation, and coalitions. Organizational refers to stuff like policy, disability awareness training, and programs. On-site assesses whether a building is fully accessible inside, outside, and all around. On-site also looks at the availability of healthy foods and the access to physical activity. Okay, time for the feel-good ending. That's definitely not what I meant. So, you've completed the process, identified what needs an assessment, assessed it, planned, implemented the plan, and you received a great evaluation. Awesome. Take a little time to be proud of the fact that Susie's store is now healthier and a lot more accessible to people with disabilities. Soak it all in, but not for too long, 
because your city still needs you. Look there, the chi signal. Somewhere in this city, the chi is needed. But take the elevator, because the gift of flight, it's not in the chi tool bag. Assessment is one of the, the most first and important steps to understand what needs to be changed um, or addressed. And our second piece of the um, iChip, thank you, so many are one of our many packages, is um, inclusion in planning and leadership. And so one of the pieces that can help with implementation is the Community Health Inclusion Sustainability Planning Guide. So uh, Kelly mentioned earlier that this is an addendum to the CDC's Sustainability and Planning Guide for Healthy Communities. Um, and this, this is basically a CDC book that provides different strategies and guidance on how to create a healthy community. And so what we have done with this addendum is provide the guidance on how to create an inclusive healthy community and one of, the, one, one of the most important strategies that um, is used, right, in, in communities are health coalitions. And so what we really promote are inclusive health coalitions, making sure that um, people with disabilities are at the table so that they are included in all of the communities health promotion initiatives that are ongoing, whether that is assessment or actual programs and services being provided. Um, and so the idea behind this guide is that it is going to help create those sustainable, inclusive um, uh, health opportunities within the community for all. Um, and then now, but also will be lasting for that in the future. Oh, here we go. So that's pretty much what I just said. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and again, the aim really here is, you know, by creating inclusive communities that we're going to help reduce some of the health disparities due to the barriers um, that prevent people with disabilities from accessing healthy activities within their environment. So again, there's strategies on how to develop, implement, and evaluate a community's health promotion programs. What the guide, the guide does not do, it doesn't necessarily tell you how to create the coalition, um, but, uh, or the initial community action plan, but it does give strategies on, um, on ways to think about it in an inclusive manner. All right, so next we're gonna talk about the next element, which was inclusion and communication. And we've already talked about this a little bit uh, with your imaging and what your message says, because we know this is really key and we wanna know, you wanna know that your message is saying, yes, you're welcome here. So communication is key. It's what lets someone know that um, they want your product, or at least is that they're able to participate in whatever you, it is that you're promoting. So it's asking the question, does our imaging or message show people with a disability that they are included? So we've come up with two main resources for this, um, and we have the Inclusive Health Communication Guidelines, and this is online on our website again. The purpose of these guidelines is to provide a list of strategies to help you or your organization make sure that all forms of your health communication are inclusive so that your message not only reaches the folks with a disability and who you're wanting it to, but it also impacts them. Um, and so it's making sure that it, it's actually targeting those areas. For example, if you're only advertising via a flyer on a community board, how will someone with a visual impairment ever see this? So there's no impact to them. So the main focus is on considering individuals with disability when crafting your messages and campaigns and ensuring that the communicated message has an impact on all and it's um, how and where to include those messages. So it kind of talks about all those components. And then we also recommend that at least one in five or one in six of your social media messages or whatever messages you're putting out are inclusive, either by um, wording or by picture. And re where we get that number from is the one in five people in the United States with a disability. And so we're taking those same numbers and saying that one in five or one in six of your messages, depending on the stats that you look at, um, should make sure that they're addressing folks with a disability. The second thing that we created was an inclusive health communication scorecard. Uh, this is a self-scoring assessment that helps you determine just your 
level of inclusion on your message. So if you went to that link below, um, you could enter in, you would just uh, answer a series of questions and it would kind of give you a score. You're, you could come up with a score of yourself to see how you rated on inclusion. Um, we also, I won't show this video, but just in case, uh, again, as another great training tool for your staff, this is a whole video on how to recruit folks with disability. Um, so it's definitely on the more humorous side, but it just basically opens the eyes to the concept of, you know, if your billboard's way up high and you have someone who uses a wheelchair, they're never going to see that research study flyer or whatever it is. And so it just talks about all the different components that you need to be sure that you're doing when you're trying to recruit people with disabilities. Because again, you know, it's great if we have all these programs and we're adapting all of these uh, programs like we did, like Girls on the Run. But if no girls with disability come because it says Girls on the Run, then, then we kind of failed. We missed the point. And so it, it was, you know, it takes us going to different organizations and those organizations adopting the policy of how do we really recruit folks with a disability? How do we let girls know that we want them regardless of how they ambulate? Um, and so that's what this that video really kind of talks about. Okay, thank you. All right, so here's another, uh, what we call the brain booster. Make sure you're all still there. Um, what are three barriers to inclusion that we discussed earlier? And here they are. No, they have, they have to pick one. Oh yeah, no, that is what the options. A, B, or C. All right, hopefully you got that right. B. So while we definitely know there's other barriers or barriers that can even be included under architectural attitude or programmatic, um, these were happen to be the three that we talked about today. Okay, moving on to inclusion and in training, information and consultation. And this is uh, something that we provide, we could provide to your organization, kind of like we're doing today. Um, or it's one that we have on through our e-learning platforms that you guys could use, ones that are already there. But it's a large part of kind of what we do are these training and information consultations. So some of the ways that we do this is through technical assistance, and Carrie mentioned some of these options uh, briefly a minute ago. And so we are just a free information services. We're on all forms of social media, and the ways that you can contact us are through our 1-800 number. We have an online live chat, so through the hours of 9 to 5 central time, if you went onto our website, you would see um, chat live, little uh, icon pop up, and you could click on that and get one of us. Um, or you can email us at email at nickpad.org. Again, in any question really relating to anything dealing with dyslexivity, health, wellness, nutrition, and inclusion is really, we can find those answers. And uh, some of it's really fun, like if a mom calls me and says, hey, I live in San Diego and I want to find a playground for my kid, you know, we're going to do our best to find an inclusive playground for her kid. Or if it's a fitness instructor that says, man, I just got this person, this is their disability, I have no idea, you know, where I should go from here with them, then we'll answer that for them and help them draw out what their, you know, fitness program should look like. And so really, it can run the gamut of what those questions can be, but that's, that's why we're here and that's part of our training and technical assistance. Another big one is our inclusive fitness trainer. So I mentioned this briefly already. 